the two prongs of an articulated campaign of media hysteria and mass manipulation designed to do two things, to prod Obama, the dithering Wall Street puppet, into making the decision in favor of escalation in Afghanistan. Give him a big push. Obama is dithering. Obama is stalling. He can see that his own political survival is not going to be well served by the massive escalation demanded by McChrystal. Then there's also the transformative effect inside the United States. The idea here is to take the Tea Party movement and whatever they are, and it is a mixed bag, some good elements, some uh, not so good, some bad, to push all of this in an Islamophobic and racist direction, to re-recruit the Tea Party people, if you will, for the global war on terror, which was not originally part of their design, right? They're concerned about taxation, big government, and the usual litany. They seem to allow themselves to be led around by Republican demagogues. But now the idea is make them into Islamophobes supporting imperialism, which up to now had not been one of their main issues. Now, remember, the goal in escalating in Afghanistan is the breakup of Pakistan and therefore an attack on China. You break up Pakistan, you're threatening China, you're also threatening Iran, so you're doing something geopolitical. So, all this past week, the usual reactionary ogres of the right-wing reactionary radio dial, Limbaugh, Beck, Kennedy, Levin, want to push this aspect. Now, what is the reality? I remind you of the fundamental work in this field, which is 9-11 synthetic terrorism. I wrote it in 2005 and updated it through quite a few editions. When you look at a terrorist event of this sort, you've got to distinguish the various planes of activity. It's not all one mass of, of uh, ingredients. You have got your patsies. You've got the people like Oswald or Sirhan Sirhan or Hinckley or Cho. You have got your moles. You've got the people uh, who might think of Dave Frasca of the FBI in this regard, right, that guy who couldn't put together the Minnesota report with the Phoenix Memorandum and realized that an operation was going on. And, of course, this, the idea of a mole is that you're marching to the beat of a private network, a Wall Street-dominated private network. This is not a government policy. It's a Wall Street policy brought into government through the rogue network, through this parallel government, which has been there since, well, since Grover Cleveland capitulated to J.P. Morgan in 1895. That's a long story. You've got your patsies, you've got your moles, and then you've got your technicians. You've got the people who really can do the things that are attributed to the poor, uh, scapegoated patsies. Now, um, therefore, I would urge people, look at Hassan as a patsy. Now, he's obviously a deeply troubled individual. Let's look at him as a combination of several ingredients. The troubled loner, classic, Lee Harvey Oswald. Let's look at Mohammed Atta, the alleged terror pilot. Of course, he couldn't be a pilot. He thought he was an actor in a drill. Mohammed Atta on 9-11. And Cho Sung Hui, the so-called 2007 Virginia Tech uh, shooter. We also got to think of Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, and uh, Hinckley and, and any number of others. John Allen Muhammad was executed this past week. The difference is this. Up to now, Islamic terrorists have come in groups, right? There's a communitarian, social, collectivist aspect to the Islamic uh, fundamentalist terrorists, so-called, as they've been dished up by the intelligence agencies. But in this case, it's a loner. So now it's a, a troubled Islamic fundamentalist loner. Oswald Atta Hinckley, and someone who's also a psychotic. He's beyond Oswald in the psychosis. He's more in the direction of Hinckley or Cho. So uh, a fanatic, a misfit, a quasi-psychotic, uh, and again, couldn't stay in business without protection in high places. Now, uh, therefore, the question is, if uh, we want to look at Hassan as a dupe, as a patsy, and see how this uh, plays out within the, uh, the events that we've observed, you would have to find, um, well, uh, let's get some evidence. Let's not listen to the talking heads on television. Let's listen to what the troops say. Now, if you scan what the individual soldiers who were 
witnesses of this uh, massacre say the one thing they all agree on is at the beginning they thought it was a drill. They thought it was a drill. They thought it was an exercise. Now, this takes us back to one of the main elements that uh, I point out in 9-11 synthetic terror. Paul, we have moles. We have patsies. We have technicians. It's all done through drills. You take a drill. You take an exercise. You flip it live. You take it live. You uh, transform it with actually somewhat minor changes, at least at the beginning, that then turn the drill from pretend uh, attack into real attack. So let's listen to Kirabono says, uh, when Hassan stood up and praised Allah, well, she doesn't even say that, but she says she thought it was a drill. She didn't believe it was a, a drill until she saw that she was bleeding. That's from ABC News, Good Morning America. Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, um, PFC Amber Barr of Random Lake, Wisconsin, says, we thought supervisors at Fort Hood were holding a drill last Thursday. She didn't know she was under live fire until she heard people screaming. Then we have Corporal Nathan Hewitt tells CBS uh, News correspondent Don Teague, Don Teague, he thought the gunfire was a training exercise and that he'd been hit by a rubber built bullet. He says that other victims thought the same thing. ABC News, Bob Woodruff talks to Captain Dory Karskadon, who says she initially thought the shooting was a drill. Now, that's a captain. We'll be back in a minute with more. Some more evidence. The soldiers who were on the scene uh, agree on one thing. They thought it was a drill. Soldier Kira Bono, U.S. Army, says she thought it was a drill. We've got uh, Private First Class Amber Barr says, we thought supervisors were holding a drill. We've got Corporal Nathan Hewitt. He thought it was a training exercise, and he'd been hit by a rubber bullet. Other victims thought the same thing. Then we've got Captain Dory Karskadon. Maybe it was a drill. She initially thought the shooting was a drill. Now, that's a field-grade officer. A captain uh, compels a certain amount of attention. We've got Specialist Scott Hamrick, First Sergeant James McLeod at the Soldier Readiness Processing Center, thought it was a drill. My initial thought is it was a drill, said Hamrick, because you know you're always getting drilled for situations. However, what Hamrick thought was a drill turned out to be something closer to home. You get the idea. Uh, in addition to this, um, the Miami Herald reports Skip Blancet, pastor at First United Methodist Church of Killeen, Texas, talking to his daughter, Holly Davis, who's either uh, a worker on the base or in the Army. She's in the building next door to where the gunman was firing. They were in a lockdown. Everyone thought it was a drill at first. And indeed, during the crisis, the first thing posted on the Fort Hood website is, this is not a drill. It is an emergency situation. So what we see from this, uh, we glean that unannounced surprise terror drills are standard operating procedure, a fact of everyday life on this Army base and other bases. Now again, what happens when the drill goes live? But now, if all of these soldiers thought it was a drill, what did Major Hassan think? Maybe he thought it was a drill, too. And when he went to it, Maybe Major Hassan, like Atta and the rest of those guys, thought that they were going to be actors in a drill. In other words, Hassan gets his pistols, props for his action, pro probably thinking it was sanctioned. This is a troubled, inept, quasi-psychotic individual, a low-grade subject, not likely to see what's taking shape around him. So he gets to the uh, scene, the readiness center, and at some point, other shooters appear who take the drill live. They start shooting with real bullets. Now, whether or not he's shooting with bullets or not, we'll look at that in a minute. 100 rounds fired. Seems like a lot of shooting for one guy. Now, Major Hassan is not a marksman. This is not a combat soldier. This is a shrink. Uh, even though he's surrounded by soldiers who are not armed, those are nevertheless combat veterans, hardened veterans, most of them. Seems like a lot of shooting for one guy with uh, 
pistols that are not exactly, uh, they're not, you know, machine guns with uh, endless feed. So the thing we have to look for is, were there other gunmen firing who knew that the drill was going to turn into a real massacre? Interestingly enough, extra gunmen is exactly what we find. So we've seen Hassan the Patsy. We've seen now the possibility of technicians, in other words, other shooters. Now, without going through all these quotes, it is clear that during most of the day, everybody, according to the news dispatches, was reporting three shooters, not one, but three. Here's a good example. Uh, London Daily Mirror, this is just U.S. Wire Services accounts. Twelve people killed, 31 wounded when three gunmen in uniform opened fire at the U.S. Army's largest armored base. One gunman was shot, the two others held at Fort Hood. These embarrassing accounts of multiple shooters, they're disappearing.